Now that naturals have become the norm for many beauty products, it stands to reason that the cosmetics industry is clamouring for interesting and exotic botanicals to make the latest and greatest claims for their formulations. Indeed, when you attend any cosmetics industry trade show, you tend to be bombarded with the hottest new plants, found in the rarest pockets of the most far-flung places around the world. But given that the beauty industry encourages us to consume endless personal care products, should we really be using that many rare and exotic plants? And if we do, should they be cultivated for us, potentially using land that could be used to feed people, or should we be using wild populations of plants? As you'll remember from my recent podcast on whether essential oils can ever be sustainable, we discussed this very topic, and it's one that I feel the beauty industry really isn't addressing properly yet. So what happens when beauty brands decide to go down the wild harvesting or wild sourced route for the plants in their formulations? How do we know that this is a sustainable way to source ingredients? One certification body called Fair Wild is working hard to look after our global wild plant resources and the people that depend on them. In this episode, we're going to pick apart how the beauty industry can use wild plant harvesting and ask whether we're doing more harm than good in using wild plant resources for cosmetics. Welcome to Green Beauty Conversations, the podcast that challenges you to think about how you buy, use, make and sell your natural beauty formulations. We tackle topics that will make you think and encourage debate about green beauty with your friends, followers or customers. I'm your host, Lorraine Dahlmeyer. I'm a chartered environmentalist, biologist, and the CEO of award-winning online organic cosmetic formulation school, Formula Botanica. We have thousands and thousands of students in over 175 countries around the world who study with us to become organic beauty formulators and entrepreneurs. Visit our website at formulabotanica.com to try our free online formulation course. So in today's episode, I am joined by Emily King who's the Business Engagement Officer in the Secretariat of the Fair Wild Foundation, a non-profit initiative with the mission to secure a fair and sustainable future for wild plant resources and people. She works with current and potential fair wild businesses to help them to make the most of their certification, as well as working on wider communication around the importance of sustainable sourcing and the fair wild standard. We're going to talk about the sustainability of wild harvesting and how the beauty industry can embrace certification to make better choices in their supply chain. Hi, Emily. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you. I'm excited to be here and talk a bit more about uh, sustainable cosmetics and wild plants. Yes, and I'm thrilled to have you here. This is such a great topic. So let's first start with introductions. What is Fair Wild and what led to the creation of the certification standard? Yeah, so that's a, a, a great question. So Fair Wild is a standard for sustainability and ethical trade of wild harvested plant ingredients. Really came about um, when there was not much going on in, in this sort of space in terms of looking at wild plant ingredients. Uh, so Fair Wild started um, about 12 years ago now. And at the time, there's really a lot of focus on organic, on fair trade, which are really, really great things. Um, but they were more focused on um cultivation of products. So things like bananas, coffee, cocoa, not a lot of focus around things that you might actually be collecting from the wild instead. Um, So where we might see more um, cosmetic ingredients coming in. Also, those standards didn't really recognize, I mean, even if they could be applied to to wild plant ingredients harvesting situations, they weren't really tailored for the the sort of unique situations that we see there. So things such as um, it often being a very seasonal occupation, Whereas for conventional agriculture, there might be something happening all year. Um, It might be more smaller groups of rural people, potentially quite marginalised. So often women um, in rural areas with very few other sources of income might be participating in this trade. And also also tied up with a lot of traditional and cultural practices, which sort of aren't recognised in those sort of standard sustainability schemes, but are really important and integral to the harvesting of wild plant ingredients. Um, so Fair Wild was really created to recognise both that traditional knowledge and the importance of wild plant harvesting and trade for, for rural people and for local communities, but also the fact that they're without um, monitoring and without a care taken around this trade, there was a potential for a really negative impact on biodiversity, not just of the plant species, but also the landscapes they're being harvested from. 
Wow, what a fantastic track record as well. Well, thank you very much for, for coming on today to talk about this. So let's go back to basic definitions then. What is a wild plant and how does Fair Wild define wild harvesting? That is uh, also another tricky one. I mean, you might think that it would be obvious. So at either end of the sort of the scale, it, it is quite clear. So marigold grown in a field with inputs put into the production, so, you know, pesticides or fertilizers and so on. That's quite obviously not wild. I think most people would agree on that. And at the other end, we have maybe Brazil nuts harvested from the Amazon, where there's very little development. It's sort of local people who lived in the area for a very long time. And most people probably think, okay, that's quite clearly wild. But then in the middle, we've got all this gray area. So we've got things um, such as uh, nettle leaves, which are growing near agricultural fields. We've got bearbab fruit, which is harvested from around trees growing near r- rural villages in Zimbabwe. We've got rose hips, which are being harvested in Lesotho or maybe Chile, where they weren't there uh, maybe hundreds of years ago, but they have been reintroduced and have been there for a long time now. Would we consider that wild or, or because they haven't been there for some sort of arbitrary amount of time? Are we saying that actually they're not? So, It is quite a complex area in the middle there. And we have put a lot of thought into this. Uh, We have some guidance notes for companies that are interested to to learn more about how we maybe make decisions on whether something is considered to be within scope of fair wild or not. Um, And that looks at things such as the degree of management for the species that's being harvested. Um, As I said, is it a native species or has it been introduced? And if so, has it been naturalized to some degree? And what is the impact on the original habitat? and whether the population of that species is self-sustaining and so on. Um, yeah, so it's a more complex question than you might originally think. <laughs> yes, as I, I, can, uh, I can hear that. I mean, there's obviously a lot of grey areas in there, which is why it's obviously good that you, you guys have put so much thought into this, because this touches very much on the beauty industry, I can tell. So before we get into beauty, what are the biggest ecological challenges faced by these populations of wild plants and, and lichens and fungi as well around the world? These species that are harvested for um, a range of uses, so it, beauty um, industry, obviously, but also herbal tinctures, herbal teas, um, and so on, they face the same pressures that all of biodiversity is facing. So that's things such as changing climates, increased rain, increased drought, um, temperature changes, and so on. They also have pressures from land use change. So maybe it's clearance of area for agriculture, maybe it's putting in a new road, more people moving in or out of an area, pollution, and also over-harvesting of species is is a very big problem for not not just wild plants, but for biodiversity globally. So wild plants and fungi and lichen aren't really an exception, but what the main threats are to each species will vary depending on what the species are. So it might be that um, for bearbab trees in Zimbabwe, so bearbab is is used for cosmetic oil, that um, climate change may be having an impact, but we might not be seeing it quite yet. It might be more we're thinking about um, change in land use or the incentives for conserving those trees. So Fair Wild really focuses on the threats caused by harvesting for trade, you know, knowledge that there are all those other threats as well. But it's also thinking about what is the important to consider in terms of how can we address the threat caused by trade and over-exploitation. It's obviously not an easy question and not an easy answer by the sounds of things. And it's something that the beauty industry is starting to talk about a little bit more, which is great. So let's move on to beauty then. So what has been the uptake of the Fair Wild standard in the beauty industry? And is this a certification standard mainly for beauty brands selling finished products? Or is this also for ingredient growers and suppliers? Just to explain a bit about Fair Wild's history, just to put it in context. So as I mentioned, it's about 10 to 12 years now that Fair Wild has been in operation as a standard and also as a certification scheme. Um, and really where Fair Wild started was with some pilot projects in Eastern Europe. So post-conflict Balkans area was really the, the origin of Fair Wild. So a lot of the original products that were certified were really Eastern European sourced herbs. And it's really only in the last um, sort of five years or so that we've really begun to break out of that original uh, sort of area focus and moving more into fragrance, cosmetics, oils and so on. Um, So there are now a number of ingredients are certified which have cosmetic applications. 
Um, so, for example, there's Peru balsam from El Salvador, frankincense from Somaliland, berbab oil from Zimbabwe, rose hips from Serbia. Um, recently, actually, really excitingly, a jatamansi oil, uh, so spikenard from Nepal. So it has uh, lots of aromatherapy associations and uses as well. Yeah, it is certainly a growing area. We maybe don't have as much history in terms of certified ingredients as some of the other sort of European herbs, as I mentioned. But it is also, I think, uh, mirroring a growing interest from the beauty industry as well in terms of sustainability and traceability and ethics of where ingredients are coming from. It's my feeling, and I think this is mirrored in, in sort of research, market research as well, but that the beauty industry perhaps has been maybe further behind the curve in terms of thinking about sustainability and, and ethical sourcing than maybe the food and drinks industries. And I think that's changing. I do think it's changing, though. And I think that's that's going along with Farewell's sort of increasing presence in this industry as well. Uh, and grow consumer awareness, you know, interest in clean beauty, really sort of looking more into what the ingredients actually are in, in cosmetics and beauty products. And in general, sort of uh, across the board, I think not just industry or sector by sector as well, but the growing general consciousness of the impact of purchasing decisions in our, our lives on the planet we live on. Absolutely. And it's interesting you raise that. I mean, obviously, I've been talking about this a lot on the podcast recently. Beauty has suddenly woken up to the fact that sustainability is a thing and they need to really do something about it. And I'm not surprised that the uptake is is increasing at Fair World as a result of that as well, which is great to hear. So thinking about the way that you assess the supply of wild plants, what sustainability criteria does the Fair World standard look at? Yes. Yeah, so the, the standard, just to differentiate a bit from certification. This, so the standard is, for anyone that doesn't know, um, is what is behind the certification. So the standard itself is freely available on, a, on the Fair World website and businesses can be certified against that standard. So it's really for collection operate. So what we turn collection operations. So that's the businesses at the green end, uh, if you'd like to think of that, of the supply chain. So the, the ones that are really going out into habitats and harvesting plant ingredients. They can have an audit done, that says, yes, we are uh, meeting the criteria in the standard. And some of the criteria for sustainability in that, well, actually, so I, I was going to answer about the ecological um, sustainability side, but actually there's a lot in there in terms of social and economic sustainability as well. So it's not just the plants and biodiversity. It's also about the sustainability of trade for the people involved in it, long-term business relationships and so on. So in, just focusing though on the ecological sustainability aspects, um, there's a few different things that are looked at. So there's an initial risk assessment done of the species that is undergoing certification. And that aims to place the harvest of that species in a more global context. So it might look at um, what is the plant part that is harvested. So, you know, harvesting of a root will have a very different impact from, from berries or leaves. One will be maybe more impactful on the survival of that individual plant. The international threat status, so what is known about the, the that species at a global level, a global trade trends, and so on. That then informs what the businesses themselves do. So they are, are expected to come up with a resource assessment. So they'll look at what the population of that species is in the, their area, their specific area of harvest. And that will inform, in turn, a management plan. So they have to think about, OK, this is the, the stock of, of species that is in the area we wish to harvest from and also more widely what is really known uh, in terms of what is sustainable volume of offtake of that, that species, uh, considering what part it is we're, we're wanting to harvest, what traditional local knowledge is there as well that might inform that management plan. And th there's more aspects as well, but they're the sort of key parts that need to be um, looked into and drawn up by the collection operation that the business doing the harvesting to think about what is the impact of their operations and how can they make it more sustainable. And then that also has to be fed down to each of the actual individual people doing the collecting. Um, so there's training required, resources that's supposed to be shared. Uh, and all of that is looked at during an audit as well to really make sure it's not just sort of one person in, in a room in an office maybe coming up with these things that they just stay on paper. But really, they are living documents and living processes that feed down to all aspects of the, the supply chain. Wow, it sounds like there's a lot of work involved, which is very impressive to hear. Um, following on from that, then, thinking more about the cosmetics industry again, listen, uh, I'm sure our listeners are trying to think of examples where this could be applied. And I know that you've worked with some beauty brands already. So could you give us one or two examples of cosmetic plants that the, that Fairwild has assessed and helped create a more su sustainable supply chain for? Yeah, for sure. Um, and so, as I mentioned, I think earlier there are a few different species. I mean, just to pick one to start with. So, frankincense is a really nice one. So, there's obviously a few different frankincense species. When 
The currently certified frankincense for Fairwild is supplied by a company called Nea Botanica. So they are Fairwild certified for Boswellia Sacra from Somaliland. They are the first certified collection operation of, of any description in Somaliland. So that was a really exciting, exciting moment for Fairwild. Um, they do lots of things such as really getting to grips with the tree health and tree population in, in the harvesting area. So they look at, as I said, the health of individual trees, what is the population size, what is the growth of that population, and that all informs their sustainable management plan. But then to complement that, they also do a lot of work with local rural people in terms of employment opportunities, fair wages and so on. So there's employment of people in their local processing facilities, you know, sorting the resin and so on. And they also really emphasize the participation of women in that as well. And they're actually excitingly looking to expand the number of ingredients. So they started with a frankincense species and a myrrh species. Um, that was two years ago now. Um, and they're looking to expand in terms of the number of ingredients they often are certified. So other frankincense species, other myrrh species, and also a gamma Arabic. So all of those have um, cosmetic applications. Um, and it's really nice to see that well, frankincense especially, we've had other frankincense certified collection operations before and more are coming through now, actually. Because frankincense is getting so much more attention at the moment in terms of, great, rightly so, globally in terms of really growing awareness, not just scientifically of the pressure on frankincense species and their resilience or, or sort of suffer, uh, how much they can be impacted by collection. But also, I think as an industry as well, there's more conversation around, OK, this is uh, there's awareness of this potential problem with unsustainable collection. We really need to focus on how we can have sustainable collection and how we can keep this great, really sort of charismatic, evocative species and product here for generations to come. Yeah. Oh, gosh, I love frankincense so much. It's wonderful to hear you say that. I suppose tying in with that, let's go a little bit controversial for a minute, because some people would argue that it's better to leave wild plants alone when it comes to the cosmetics industry, as our consumption of beauty products is out of control and inherently unsustainable. I mean, we touched on it earlier. One of my recent podcast guests, for instance, felt strongly that we already use so much land to grow beauty crops that we should leave pockets of biodiversity alone. So can wild plant populations really keep up with the demand of the beauty industry and is the issue of overconsumption something that you take into consideration when certifying brands or, or ingredient suppliers for their sustainability initiatives around wild plant harvesting? Uh, I, I suppose frankincense is a good example there as well. Yeah, and I think that's a really valid concern uh, to be voicing. You know, there's no denying overconsumption generally, not, not just the beauty industry, is a real problem and the cause of a lot of the issues that we're facing in the world at the moment. So, yeah, I don't dispute that at all. Um, what I would say in terms of uh, the amount of the impact of, on biodiversity of wild harvesting is that that is where we, uh, I mean, I would say this, this is, I work for Fairwell, but I, I really do believe that there is a role for sustainable use of biodiversity. The, the, one of the points about fair wild is that it has minimal impact on the habitat. So it's not just about the individual plant species. You know, you can't say, OK, we'll go in and harvest the resin from this frankincense species and we'll completely level the rest of the land. That tree is fine, but we're going to uh, you know, completely destroy the rest of the habitat. And that is not how fair wild is supposed to work. You know, we wouldn't pass an audit with that um, kind of approach. The collection operations have to also consider the wider habitat um, plants they're, they're harvesting from exist in. They have to think about the impact on uh, keystone species, for example, um, and, and really take that all into account. And it's not just about taking the, the plant in isolation. As I've, as I've sort of mentioned throughout this discussion, it's also about the people that are relying on them and the traditional multi-generational impact of the relationship that, that they have with those plant species as well and how much harvesting might be integrated into their culture and traditions. Um, I think there was a study out earlier this year talking about how many, uh, I think it was languages, are, are potentially going to die out because they are associated so closely with harvesting of ingredients from the wild. I think it's a UNESCO, I might be making this up now, but uh, yeah, it was definitely a study looking at how threatened sort of small scale culture is because of this association and loss of habitat and diversity. So it's really, I think, not just about saying, no, this is a no-go area. We, we're just going to fence that off and, and leave it be. It's about thinking, okay, these practices already exist and they are maybe very important for the economy of those people that live there. And how can we make that the best it can be? So it's not just about, you know, clear cutting trees down or ripping everything up. It's about thinking, taking a more holistic approach to things um, and, 
yeah, really sort of taking a mindful approach to it and thinking about, okay, how can we make it sustainable? How can we make it long lasting? Um, um, yeah, and thinking about overconsumption as well. So it's not something that is sort of explicitly taken in in terms of the end product. But within the standard as well, there is expectation that businesses will look at um, the demand from their customers. That's where the long term business relationships that I mentioned came in, um, things like quality requirements and so on. So, so there is expectation there is this dialogue between the certified op business and their customers in terms of what, how much do you actually need next year? How much can we, can we deliver? And so the amount actually harvested doesn't differ too much from what they already have purchase commitments for at least not without justification. So no, it really minimizes that loss at the, at the early stages of the supply chain as well. Oh, wow. Okay, that's fascinating. Okay, so what do you think then are the biggest challenges for the beauty industry when it comes to the harvesting of wild plants? Yeah, so this is a, a, a big question, I guess. It's, I mean, I think the first one for me is really awareness. So it's not just the beauty industry, it's all sort of sectors of industry and it might use wild plant ingredients and consumers as well, actually. Just being aware that actually wild plants are in so many ingredients that we use every day. And some brands do capitalize on the sort of wild aspect and integrate it into their, their marketing and communications and really sort of focus on that as a USP. But so many more brands do use wild plant ingredients and either that's not sort of celebrated and, and shared with their consumers or it's maybe something they're not even aware of. If, if they're maybe a smaller company and they're purchasing not directly from source, but from a intermediary trader or processor, there might not be that dialogue necessarily. You know, if you're just purchasing from a catalog, especially for a startup, it can be quite difficult to really know necessarily the audience and outs of where a product is sourced from if you're buying it from an aggregator. So I think awareness really is the first one. And getting more awareness amongst consumers as well. So because with that awareness and even understanding that this is happening sort of leads into awareness of, okay, there are potential great opportunities here for sure in terms of like unique ingredients, um, benefits for wild plants and and people in terms of um, development and so on. But also thinking about, okay, well, with that comes the the flip side, which is the potential risks, you know, exploitation, child labor, uh, degradation of habitat and so on. And and with that will come more interest in sustainable sourcing of ingredients. So I think especially for startups, uh, I would say that having those conversations is an important first step with whoever you're purchasing ingredients from, you know, really think about where do these ingredients come from? What can you tell me about the story? Especially because they'll often be a really amazing marketing or sort of communications angle as well. You know, it could be a really great USP thinking about not just plants, which aren't necessarily, like, for the properties of the plants, it could be an interesting selling point, but of themselves, maybe not necessarily as charismatic and engaging as a panda bear or an elephant. But actually, a lot of so both panda bears and elephants do coexist with plant species that are used. So the elephants and baobab go hand in hand. Giant pandas and schisandra are used in actually as a sort of detox ingredient, especially in traditional Chinese medicine, but in other sort of uses as well. So there there are these great stories that can be told and from using wild plant ingredients. So it's not just about digging in to try and find holes in in your um, supplies sourcing, but also about, you know, what great stories can we unearth and and bring to Mm. light here? I love it. So a lot of work ahead of us, but obviously Fairwild is paving the way for us. So if people want to find out more about Fairwild, where can they do so? Well, we have a website um, which has a lot of information on it, um, but it's more of a starting point. So it it sort of explains a bit about what Fairwild is, some of the things we discussed here. Um, But the best way is to really uh, get in touch directly if people want to know more. So our email address is on our website, um, secretariatfairwild.org. We also have webinars and guidance documents which are updated on, on our website, but also we have a newsletter where people can stay up to date on that. And one thing I'd like to leave with as well in terms of if there are businesses that are interested in, they've sort of been captured by what I've said here or we've discussed and are interested in actually using Fair Wild ingredients, get in touch, certainly. But we do have a special, um, we've launched this year a special way that smaller businesses, so, so startups or um, SMEs, can sort of start their Fair Wild journey, but with much lower cost and administrative burden. So that means they can register to, if they're using Fairwell ingredients in their products, they can register, put the label on their packaging, but they don't have to, they, they have much lower fees and they don't have to do some of the reporting that we would otherwise do. Just to, so they can start celebrating the journey and the, what fantastic stories these wild plant ingredients have. 
Fantastic. And just to clarify, this is global as well, right? Yes, it's global. Yeah, there's no restriction with where Fair Wild certification can be applied or which brands um, can use Fair Wild ingredients. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today, Emily. It's been really interesting chatting to you. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time out. Well, thank you. It's been great. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I hope it's given you some food for thought about the wild harvesting of plants used in our beauty formulations. I'd love to hear what you think about the whole discussion. Please do come and leave us a comment on our social channels as both the Formula Botanica team and I love hearing from you. And make sure you take part in the sustainable beauty polls and chats I run over on my Instagram channel at Lorraine Dalmayer. Thank you for joining Emily and I for this latest episode of Green Beauty Conversations. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please do leave us a five-star review so that other people can enjoy these conversations too. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or Spotify or whatever your favorite podcast app is and stay tuned for the next episode. Follow Formula Botanica at Formula Botanica on Facebook, Instagram, Clubhouse, Twitter, YouTube or LinkedIn. Visit our website at formulabotanica.com and sign up for our free online formulation course today. Today.